welcome to this morning's uh, staff colloquium. Uh, I think you're in for a treat today. Uh, our speaker is uh, Yu Chung Tai from Caltech, who's going to talk to us about next generation neural implants. And many of you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with NIST? And what? Well, I think you'll see a lot of connections to some of the work going on here at NIST, including work in MEMS, uh, work in tissue engineering, uh, work on chip scale clocks, chip scale magnetometers, and things like that. Uh, YC Tai is a director of the Caltech Micromachining Laboratory. He's a, a professor of electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and bioengineering at Caltech. He's also a uh, collaborating member of the BMES, or BMES, the uh, Biomimetic Microelectronic Systems Research Center at the uh, University of Southern California. Uh, that uh, the USC BMES Center has been funded since, I think, 2003 by the NSF and is one of their centers of engineering excellence. <clears throat> the objective there, <clears throat> excuse me, and also the objective of a lot of the research you're going to hear about today is to restore uh, neural function through biomimetic microelectronic systems. In, in, a, in a word, it's to help the blind see, to help uh, reanimate paralyzed limbs, and to help to restore cognitive functions where there is a dysfunction or need for repair. Uh, YC's research interests are uh, focused on MEMS, uh, microelectronic mechanical systems, uh, MEMS systems, and technology. Uh, he has developed and built uh, microsensors, microactuators, microfluidic devices, uh, a lot of research on lab and on a chip technology, and has also, in the last uh, uh, five to ten years, uh, gone into this area of, of I'll call it tissue engineering. Uh, he's originally from Taiwan, uh, where he got his undergraduate degree. He got his master's and PhD degrees at the University of California in Berkeley and that was in the electrical engineering and computer science departments. His uh, 1989 thesis won a prize at the university. Uh, that subject of that was polysilicon mechanisms and micromotors. Uh, YC is a fellow of the uh, IEEE, a fellow of the Institute of Physics. <clears throat> Among his uh, research accomplishments uh, in his uh, still young career, uh, first of all, he designed and built the micromachining lab at Caltech. For those of you involved in some of the nanofab activities, either in Boulder or here at NIST, you might be interested. It's 8,000 square feet, which is about 30 of our lab modules here in Gaithersburg. And about half of that is a clean room facility at Caltech. He has designed and built a MEMS control system for unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, so-called UAVs. Uh, he's also designed for the UAVs a flexible drag reduction smart skin, something that kind of, uh, I guess, changes depending upon what resistance it's uh, meeting in the air. Uh, in the last seven years since the, uh, his involvement with the BMS Center, uh, he's gotten involved in biomedical applications. This includes the, uh, the building of microchannel uh, devices, micro valves and pumps, bioreactors, uh, and this has led to his interactions with the USC people on retinal implants and uh, other eye applications, and also on uh, uh, projects involving artificial muscle applications. I think you'll find his talk interesting. I, I should mention also, along the way, he's received several teaching awards at Caltech, so that uh, YC is uh, also known not only for his research, but for his communication and teaching abilities. Would you join me in welcoming YC Tai? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for wonderful introduction. I never know I've, I have done that much. Uh, but uh, it's really my great honor to talk to you today, uh, especially on this uh, subject, uh, next generation neural implants. I, I uh, somehow used the name. Uh, uh, two years ago because I was invited to give a talk in Next Generation Meeting. Uh, 
and I say I want to talk about neural implants, they add the next generation in front of it. So uh, uh, I, I've, been, I've been using that. Uh, so I, I would show you some of the work we think we have to do, and we think gonna impact our society in the future uh, in a great way. Uh, let me just start with this. This is examples of current neural implants. And it's, it's very familiar, most of you know, this is a defibrillator or a pacemaker. Uh, keep your heartbeat in, in, the, in the right state. And this is uh, also commercialized cochlear implants. Uh, tens of thousands of people have been using these devices. There's one feature. What you see is there's always electrodes. Because in order to do neural implants, you need electrical stimulation or recording. But this is something electrical engineers like me, we hate to see. When, whenever we see devices like that and there's a big, big boxes, that actually is the metal case to protect all the electronics. And they are usually very big and usually they do not become smaller. In fact, this technology is 50 years old technology. And they've been improving this by really slow pace. Well, one can always blame FDA, but in fact, this box is really old and things should be done. Especially later on, I'm going to show you some example. This is again, this is a, the recent breakthrough. A lot of people say this is a huge breakthrough. It has been linked to control Parkinson's disease and, and, it, and so on, the deep brain stimulator. Some people call it DBS. So what you see is there are two electrodes, very deep, insert into the brain, but yet, you see this wire have to come out from the brain all the way and with a metal box put in front of the chest. Don't you think this is awkward? I think it's awkward. Although this is the state of the art technology, there's nothing better than that. Now, here comes the problem. And problem actually was obviously advertised as very interesting advancement. This is 2005 Reader's Digest. This is their uh, thousands issue. There's 14 amazing trends. If you take a look at the trend, one of the trends they point out hugely, in addition to this DBS, deep brain stimulator, is this retinal implants. They actually quoted retinal implant to be one of the most uh, important or 14 amazing trends that will change our life. But now you think about retinal implant, you think about devices you need to put inside your eyes. Can you have that big metal case? It ain't gonna work. There are a lot of organs. If we talk about neural implants, or well, not neural implants, just normal implants, other kind of implants, you have, to, you have to start to concern about the size. And over here I will show you, believe it or not, it's still big metal case. And then later on I will show you what do we mean about next generation implant. Now first let me talk about blindness. If you talk about retinal implant, uh, talk about blindness. It's, it's very interesting. Probably it's the second most feared disease next to cancer. Uh, it, it, to be blind is really not fun. Right? It's, uh, and, and over nine million Americans suffer vision loss. So, so it's a serious problem. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a look at the history, uh, history actually is very, very long, so I can only just, just itemize these uh, for you. Starting 1755, people are already curious about blindness uh, and also about vision. I will show you one slide. It's fascinating uh, a work that done in 1755. Then in 1929, 1956, 68, and all the way down to today. There are a long history of research or study in terms of vision and loss of vision, how, how to do something about the vision. So this is 1755, it's, it's amazing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an experiment done on a blind patient. You can see they use a circular electrode wrap around the head right there. And then the other wire actually is connected to the leg and then shock the patient, right? basically just discharge a capacitor. And the patient described that he sees some flame rapidly descending. So basically something is triggered. In fact, uh, even today we talk about this, nobody's really sure what happened. Visual cortex got stimulated, or maybe 
is a, is a, is a optical nerve got stimulated. There are many possibilities, but at least suddenly a blind subject claimed that he saw something. That is interesting, right? And then uh, this is a this is a 1968. This is a visual. This is a visual prosthesis, and what you see is a lot of handmade devices. So whenever I look at these things, I would say, well, the future cannot continue this way. These devices have to change. So before I do that, let's talk about clinical problems, and and those are the problems we'll focus on among my uh, collaborators at USC. The pathology is the AMD, advanced macular disease. And also RP, uh, uh, this, uh, the uh, pigmentosa, retinitis pigmentosa, are the leading causes of age-related blindness. These diseases are characterized by a loss of photoreceptors. So in our retina, there are many, many different cells. But these diseases cause the death of photoreceptors. If you don't have sensors, photosensors, your eye don't see. However, one important thing is the neuron cells, the ganglion cells in the retina are still good. They are still waiting to be triggered. They're still waiting to send signals to the brain. But you don't have photoreceptors. So therefore, there's a way you can trigger those what we call the phosphines or bright spots by stimulating these neurons. This is, this is a, this is a the basic problem we're trying to uh, the attack. So this is a RP, retinitis pigmentosa. Normal vision, if you have this disease, what happens is peripheral photoreceptors die and only the macular photoreceptor may remain. And the worst than this, actually, if the disease uh, further progress, then completely black. So 500,000 in USA, uh, 20,000 legally blind, the bad thing is there's no or little treatment. There's no drug for this. Once you have it, you have it. It cannot be reversed. The only treatment that I was told is you can provide the patient a, a lot of nutritious ingredient, try to stabilize the, the condition, but it cannot be reversed. This is uh, age-related macular disease. They call it AMD, or uh, some, sometimes you see the R over there, age-related macular disease. It's opposite. What happens is the macular cause problem, and then you lose the vision of the macula. This is what people see. And this is especially for dry, advanced macular disease, two to three medium in US, 85% are dry type, and again, there's no or little treatment. There's no drug. It's not like other diseases. You can, you can do a lot of things and maybe even reverse the disease. So if you take a look at possible approaches, this is a cross-section of the retina. And, and usually, usually the simplest way people uh, describe the retina is there are three layers of cells. In fact, there are more than 10 or even up to 20 different kind of cells, depending on how you count it. The, this, this is the outer cells, this is inside the eye, so this is the eyeball, inside the eye. This is what we call the ganglion cell. These are nerve cells with axons con connected all the way to the brain. And then the bottom, the bottom cell, these are photoreceptors, with people call it rod and cones, depending on the shape, and, 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 and those are the photoreceptors. So photoreceptors are dead. Let's assume these photoreceptors die. These are the ganglion cells you need to stimulate. Now, typically, there are two ways two way to uh, tackle this problem. One is what they call the subretinal. That means some device can be inserted into this retina and below, below the ganglion cells. Typical device people are talking about is like a solar cell. It's like solar cell, the concept of a solar cell. So when the light comes in, generate some electricity and trigger the electricity out, and hopefully the ganglion cells are stimulated. That approach was brilliant, but uh, uh, based on last 10 years' experience, this technique actually has a lot of problems. First of all, the biggest problem is the electricity that's generated by the light may not be enough to trigger the ganglion cells. So that has been the biggest problem. Another approach then is what we call the epiretinal implants. It's like a contact lens. 
you build a device, has a shape, a curve, the curvature, and then attach this device directly to the surface of these ganglion cells. And then with the electro, you can stimulate that. This is what we call the epiretinal. And today, I'm going to focus more or less on this. This turns out to show the most promising uh, results. So this is, this is two approach to know. And epiretinal seems to be the choice. Now, there are many people working on some degrees of retinal implants. Okay. Uh, uh, most of them are in the early stage. But this is one example. It's uh, also one of our collaborators. The, uh, the, by second site, uh, they call it Argus-1 clinical trial. This is the first device uh, we believe that has shown really promising the human test. I'm going to show you. Uh, this is the strategy, how it works. So it's very good to know how does it work. First of all, there's an external camera mounted on a glass, uh, glasses. And then uh, this camera will capture the picture of the real world. Of course, uh, there's a lot of research still going on in terms of what's the frame rate it should be and what, how much information you really need because the purpose is to stimulate the ganglion cells. And you go through the cable and through coil to coil <coughs> coupling and then electrodes over there and sending electrical signal and trigger the ganglion cells. Very simple, but keep in mind, this approach actually still requires a lot of devices outside the eye, and there is a cable. There is a cable penetrating the eye, into the eye. So uh, a lot of mechanical engineers could not believe that because uh, you have a cable penetrating and a lot of other devices mounted on your eyeball, and yet your eyeball needs to move uh, uh, a lot. But this is state-of-the-art technology. Let's take a look. This is a 74 years old gentleman. There's a plate. He's able to tell what is a plate or a cup in front of him. Okay, sir. Yeah. You, can, you can notice that he actually need to scan his head for a reason very clear. Cup. Ah, his cup. He made the right call. Now, the reason actually is this device is only four by four. What you see here, you can count totally 16 electrodes. And encouraging result, although it shows only four by four still demands you to increase by scanning your head. Okay? And, and, and there are a lot of interesting technology being developed through this. But one important thing, what you see over here, is these electrodes are handmade, still handmade. Those are platinum electrodes, and with the platinum wires, uh, handmade uh, uh, by great technician. So four by four. Would you go to an electronic store, buy a digital camera that's four by four? <laughs> so important question people ask is, what's the resolution that is required. So this is a simulation. What you see is as the pixel, number of pixel increase, you will, you will start to know what's in this video. In the end is a face, this person's face. What we believe is when you reach 32 by 32, roughly 1,000 pixels, you will be able to see a person's face and recognize who he is. We think this is one of the biggest thing if we do want to restore a blind person's vision, this is one thing that we want to target. So actually, we do target to try to make a thousand channel device. That is a big advancement from four by four, or compared to pacemaker single channel. Cochlear implants these days, you can have eight channel, maybe 16 channel. But here we talk about something tremendously different. All right. We talk about experimental implants. This is the work uh, done in Germany. And people, of course, try to increase the number of channels because for vision, that's important. Four by four, not enough. Even the, the company Second Science is trying to make it more like 60 channels. But there's one important thing I want to show you. I'm getting into technical things now. 
Here is a coil. You can clearly see coil. You need coils. Why you need coil? You need coil, coil coupling so you can pass power to it. You can pass information. You can pass picture or simplified picture to it. You need wireless, so you need coil. You need electronics. Sometimes not even just integrated circuits. You need passive components, capacitors and others. And then you need cables. This is actually state-of-the-art packaging technologies. Whenever you see this, do you believe this can be put inside human body and last long? I wouldn't. You will see solder bombs, lead bombs, or those solder if, if, if you have do soldering. And then there's a lot of gluing connection. Our body is very corrosive and also very sensitive. So actually, these technology, although people try from the electronic side, this technology ain't going to do it. We need new technology. Somehow, some way, we need to do it better. So this is why, why I start to call it the next generation retinal implant. Functionality has to be improved dramatically from one channel to 1,000 channels. In fact, ideally, we want to do 10,000 channels, 10,000 channels. 10,000 channel is very decent digital camera, I'm telling you, and size. There are a lot of organs. There's no space for you to have a metal case. So those are, the, these two are the biggest challenges. So we actually come up with this, what we call the ideal retinal implants to represent what we call the next generation uh, implant. It has to be small and functionality has to be twofold increase here. This is a device that actually will do the retinal implant as a vehicle to show you how this work. First of all, there will be coils. The coil actually needs to be very small. So it can sit inside our natural lens capsule. Our lens, our lens is about, depending on the size of the eyeball, it varies a little bit from eight millimeter to 10 millimeter in diameter. So the coil is about that size. It also has to have some electrical components, IC chip typically, uh, it also should contain a lot of capacitors and maybe even inductors for electrical circuit purpose. It needs to have a really nice cable connect from all the cable, this coils to the back of your retina. And here, typically, we show the position of macula, where you have the highest number of neurons. And then you must have high density electrodes. 1,000 channel is the wish. And hopefully in the future, we can extend it to 10,000 channels. This one little piece should be inside the eye. It moves with the light eye. So it has to be that small. And also, it has to be very light. You cannot add too much weight to your eye. And then gravitation may start to play the trick on you. So this thing has to be very small, 1,000 channels or more, and it has to be small and light. So this is a new strategy. If you take a look at a new strategy, which may be very, very different from the previous one, that it has long cable, there's a big metal case going and come back to the eye, penetrating the eye. But take a look at this. So if you want to see a letter E, again, there will be camera from outside on the glasses. The image is captured. And then there will be coil, you will see. This is very clean coil and two coil coupling. You send both power and image in. And, and in the future, we actually think maybe two-way communication. The implant may also send some information out. And then this device will have signal go through the cable. And again, this is high density electro and stimulate the ganglions and then leave the rest to the brain, your brain to do the imaging processing. That's another thing actually that we also learn. The human brain has tremendous power of imaging processing. In a way, the external electronics may not need to do too much signal processing. The brain actually will do a, a great job. So if you take a look at this device, three major components. There's the RF components, coils. It turns out making the coil that allow you to pass significant amount of power inside the eye is not easy. Today, 1,000 channel, our design is 100 milliwatts. We cannot go beyond that. 
If it's more than 100 milliwatt, there's a danger of cooking the eye. The temperature can be really high. Uh, you raise the temperature, you start to damage the eye. So power is a concern. In fact, today, power is a major factor to limit the number of channels we can build. On the other hand, as electronics technology continue to increase, power consumption continue to drop, we think the future allows us to do more channels. Then there will be integrated circuit again here. We need low power, low power electronics. This is very, very important. However, we need more channels. Sometimes you have to compromise. More channel means more power. Uh, then we actually need devices. This is what we call the electro array with the right materials, right biocompatibility, and it can match the retina inside the eye. So I will start to show you something. It turns out to build this device, material is very important. We cannot choose any material like what people are using in electronics industry today. I show you those hand wound coils, this packaged IC chip, you try to solder them together and put it inside the eye, you're gonna kill the eye. You cannot do that. So it turns out material is very important. This is a material I look at and I play with and I decided to use about 10 years ago. It's called pearling. It turns out this pearling is wonderful material that enables us to start to make those components. This is actually pearling C. Mostly we use is basically a benzene backbone with a chlorine on the, to replace the hydrogen. But two methyl side chains make the monomer. So you repeat this by about 100,000 times. That's a typical the molecular size. Okay, so it's 100,000 times of this monomer. It's commercialized by Union Carbide in 1954. So it's more than 50 years. It's 54 years old in the industry. It can easily be prepared from thickness 0.1 micron all the way to one millimeter. So this, this polymer is really great. It's transparent too. So transparency is very good. This material is room temperature prepared. It's chemical vapor deposited. It has a great feature. It covers every surfaces. So it's a conformal deposition. And because of that, it doesn't have a lot of pinholes. So that actually is very important. They don't have to show you a devices we make. We cannot allow a lot of pinholes. It's conformal coating that leads to uh, uh, no pinholes. It has a very low water permeability. If you compare it to most of polymer like polyethylene and other things, this material has very low water permeability. So that's also great. It can be used to protect whatever device is underneath. It's chemically inert. There's no known chemicals can easily attack this material under normal condition. There are some special chemical, if you heat it up, boil it at 200 degrees C, you may, you may start to corrode this material. But otherwise, this is very good. And it's biocompatible. This is the most important thing. There are a lot of devices being used uh, the, to, uh, the, to accept this material. And, and by US farmers, USP, uh, it has been categorized as class six materials, which means implant grade. So this material has been used for decades and has been accepted as implantable material. And many, many devices have been using these materials, including uh, for FDA approval. So what is this material? It's very simple. This material is so nice that uh, starting material is really powder, milk powder-like materials that made of dimers. So basically two monomers uh, form a dimer it will vaporize at 150 degrees C. All you need is a vaporizer. And then you send it to a pyrolysis chamber, 650 degree. The one dimer is break into two monomers. So this pyrolysis happened. And then you just pump the monomer gas into a chamber, which is usually room temperature around 20 degrees C, and you get a film. Right? And this film, again, is chemically inert. It's biocompatible. It's tremendously important for the device that I'm going to show you. In fact, this material, just show you a couple examples, pacemakers. All the wires almost at the leading edge with a connection to the metal bay, uh, the box, it's all coated with paralene. Today, a lot of devices have been coated with paralene for biomedical use, including catheters, including just normal tube you contains the blood. So this material has been well used and actually well known for FDA. All right, still, this is the first time. Uh, we actually did this uh, six months paralleling 
implantation. If you have a good idea, you can see the tiny little piece of perilene being put inside the rabbit eye. And this is the first time perilene being put inside the rabbit eye. And for six months, we do not see any immune response. So indeed, us expected, no surprise, great. Then we start to actually make devices. The first devices we make is electrodes. Electrodes actually are typically uh, made of platinum. Platinum is known also very good biocompatible uh, the materials. Uh, so actually we combine the platinum with the perylene and we also do a lot of mechanical testing. Uh, sometimes I tell people in the future, maybe in 20 years, uh, we don't know how long, if you look into people's eye and see this, don't be so surprised. Uh, we hope actually in the future a lot of people can benefit from uh, uh, eye implants like that. Now, this is also very important. We make 1,000 electro, this is, a, this is a, 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 a platinum array, five millimeter by five millimeter. Why five millimeter by five millimeter? Because that's the size of macula. So this is designed to be put right in front of the macula. It has to be curved. Inside our eye, there's nothing flat. So we develop a technology, make it f f curve. Basically, we make an eye model, and then we thermal treat this. It naturally just bend into the right form. So in the future, we can customer fit your implants, depending on your eye curvature. It's totally possible. Now, this is actually interesting. If you put inside the eye, this is really the macular. This is our device. And this device actually has a tiny little nail. Nail this device onto the macular. This is compared to a 1999, the handmade device. It's a day and night difference. More important, this is something I want to show you. This actually amazed my collaborators. This is a cross-section. If you make a cross-section over here, this is a cross-section OCT. Now, this is, uh, the OCT allows you to see the cross-section cellular uh, the structure. This is our electrodes. What you see here is a platinum so it's, it's, it's why it doesn't, it doesn't allow anything, the light to penetrate. But this is our device. This is the surface of retina. So this is the ganglion cells. This distance is about 40, 50 micron, which actually is the thickness of the membrane right on the, 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 the retina. This kind of distance control is unbelievable. Actually, two people in the past, compared to those handmade electro, it's impossible. Now, this actually would, we expect, would improve stimulation efficiency and also reduce the power that's needed to stimulate this ganglion cell. So it works really well if you consider both mechanical and electrical property. Now, this is another important thing we also uh, did. Uh, this is a pre-cure paralleling array in dogs, and this is a his histogram to show you that histology doesn't give us any evidence that there's a, there's, a, there's a cellular change of this retina, which is extremely important. Not only, not only a good close contact is achieved, underneath tissue actually is not damaged. People actually worry that if you put it too close, there will be mechanical force transmitted to the underneath the, 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 the cells, and then it can cause damage. That will, that will cause really serious problem, and we do not see that if you do it right. So let's talk about other components. So we have done this, and we also need to do these things, uh, including the coils and the chips. We are making coils using MEMS technology. What you see here is the uh, coils, and these coils are made of pure gold. Okay, pure gold actually is also regarded as biocompatible if you protect them and prevent electrochemical uh, process. However, these coils has to be specially made, so we develop what we call the folding coil technology. They need to be multiple layer, multiple terms, in the concern for power transmission. If you only do data transmission, you don't need a lot of terms. But if you want to do power transmission, I mentioned 100 milliwatts. In fact, we wish we only need 10 milliwatts. But current device require 100 milliwatts. You really need these and this technology was developed and it works actually quite well. As you can see, they are still very small. These coils typically is about a nine millimeter in diameter. We're able to make the coils. Now this is also very important. 
We also invented technologies so we can embed an integrated circuit into this flexible paralleling and the platinum cables without, without bonding wires. Okay, in the past, actually, a lot of people use bonding wire to connect IC chip to whatever the substrate. We cannot use bonding wire. Bonding wire is too weak and actually can cause damage. There's no solder. So this is a pure integrating process. On the wafer, could create a cavity. We drop the chip in there, flush them on the surface. It will run normal lithography and normal micro nano fabrication, and connection is made into the chip. The future chip actually will make him. If you assume there's 1,000 channels, that means there's 1,000, at least 1,000 connections. This technology also allow us to do that kind of number of connection, 1,000 connections. So what you see is here, if it's made, this whole thing become flexible, and there's, there's well protected and completely encapsulated by paralleling. And this technology will allow us in the future, even we make a thousand channels or more, can we connect this chip to the device we build? And it, it turns out it works. Now I'll give you one example. Some of you may know this is what we call the very chip. It has caused a lot of publicity. People worry about uh, privacy issue, but this is commercially available, very chip, broadly used for dog and cats. Uh, implant for ID identification. Uh, so a, a lot uh, in, in many states, actually, dogs and cats are mandatory to have this implant for for their identification. And the technology actually is well, a lot of electronics components sealed inside a glass tube. Sealed inside a glass tube. So in comparison, I think the future, at least RFID like this, can be flexible. In fact, that's that's one of the big problems is if it's glass tube. If you do a lo local area massage, you can break this thing. This is the first uh, flexible RFID implant, which, which is built in my lab. What you see, this is a coil. And using the technology I just described, this is a parallel substrate, but pure gold coil and connected to the commercial RFID IC chip. It's completely uh, integrated. It works beautifully. So this actually gives you a sense where we're going. We are trying to make total integration. There's no bad materials. There's no solder, no lead, no those bad things. Yet flexible. Yet small size. Okay. So I have shown you we, we can make coils. We can make chip integration. We can make high density electrodes like this. So what we really need to do is do this. In fact, even two years ago, I couldn't show you this. This was just made about two months ago. This is a student graduate. This is the first uh, integrated implants. What you see is this is the device. And three, this is a three centimeter long. This coil right here is both power and information coil. And, and keep in mind, this is one piece. So there's no soldering, there's no wire bonding. And one piece made on a single substrate. So it's a nine millimeter diameter. So it sits in the, uh, the lens capsule. And this is actually only two electrodes. So this is only one channel, though. This is only one channel, which could be used for muscle stimulation or maybe even uh, the heart muscle uh, stimulation. Uh, and there is an integrated circuit right here, integrated circuit, single channel. Also, two passive capacitors. These are biomedical grade. These two actually are added to it using a interesting, what we call the pocket technology, I'm going to show you a little bit later. So we are making fully integrated small implants. And we are working actually on a 256 channels. So the only thing that's different is this area. We want to put a 256 channel chip, which currently, unfortunately, is big, is five millimeter by five millimeter. All right, so cortical implants. If we have this technology, it doesn't have to be used for retinal implants only, so cortical. In fact, I will show you, this is a, the recent uh, uh, big advancement. A lot of people are talking about this. Uh, if you use uh, uh, cortical implants, uh, basically needles. Right now, 
what people are using amazingly, uh, the whole bunch of just uh, needles. Some people use metal needles. There's a huge array of metal needles. Some people use a silicon needle. Uh, but basically, one channel, one needle. So uh, sometimes I, I talk to my uh, collaborator, can you imagine, I want 1,000 channels, you have 1,000 needles just stick into the brain. Uh, you kill more cells than you, the cells you, you try to connect to. As, as, uh, that technology has, has to change. But the recent breakthrough shows that uh, people can connect it to neurons <coughs> and also train the neurons. So when the eye sees something and the neuron can make a decision, they can obtain the signal through the implant and then send the signal to a robotic arm <coughs> and move the arm. There's a lot of work need to be done. Uh, I was talking to Bill that one single neuron can do maybe just move the arm. But if you want the arm to have five fingers moving with multiple degrees of freedom, you need a lot more neuron. Then devices have to be developed for that. But this has been demonstrated to be possible. So actually you see, you see news that a monkey is moving a cursor on a screen, a monkey is moving a robotic arm. Uh, people actually did study this uh, visual cortex and, and show the promise. But device is still very crude. This is what I, what I uh, uh, usually show. This is what we see in the future if the needle has to be there. Each needle has to have multiple electrodes. And a lot of people work on that, including Kim Wise group, uh, the Michigan. Uh, but devices actually still has a lot, lot of problems. And the whole purpose is to get these spikes from neurons. We also make needles. In fact, I want to show you here. This is, this is very important. Uh, we feel very excited. This is paralleling technology. In, in fact, give people the hope. This is needles. In fact, people are able to make silicon needle or metal needles for the last three, four decades. Okay? And people are able to show that I can put multiple metal lines on this needle. One thing they didn't have, or they have not been able to do, is this cable, simple cable. I was told, actually, by a lot of people, just the cable, just the integrated cable is a big breakthrough. So I'll show you here. This cable actually automatically solves the interconnect problems. If you have a chance to see the current state of the art cortical implants, people are using wire. I will show you one example, although I have to apologize following this a little bit bloody. But this cable actually allows a lot of flexibility of this electrode being used in real tissue. And this is actually what people see the state of the art. Uh, this is needles. And there are a lot of cables coming out and go through the skull. And today, actually, the, the state of the art technology still requires a cable plug into the skull. The future, of course, as you can see, we want to extend our retinal implants to do wireless. So everything should be just staying over here with an electrical implant in there with a coil, and that does it. But that will take some time. But however, there's one thing we already learned that this is very important. This cable connected to the needles, this cable alone will solve a lot of problems with reliability. This, this, this is really just due to electrical connection. How do you connect metal to metal? And, and, and if you use a solder, you use uh, a, a different kind of technique or, or conductive paste. How do you protect all those conjunctions from corrosive body fluid and all that? We also actually perform a lot of tests. Uh, this is the first time I'm still not able to use Lego to do research. Uh, what you see is a, is a Lego robotic uh, uh, the gadgets to do a lot of stretching of these cables and to make sure they are mechanical reliable. Uh, they do. So then actually we reach this stage. What you see here is our two stay over the art. They call the ceramic needle, there's a, there's a needle probes. Each one has 16, each one has a 16 electrode, the maximum number if you use. And two of these make it 32. This is a device we make, the needle has been inserted into a monkey brain. This is a monkey brain. And this is one cable with 32 channel. Compared to here, 16 wires. Here's another 16 wires. This is stay over the art. Today, one channel, one wire, you really need 
have to put them together. Although it took people 20, 30 years to make extremely thin wires, so they are thin already, but it's still very rigid. Uh, I, I actually have seen cables like that. People try to put 200 this wire together. And just the wire, just the wire cable exert a lot of mechanical force all the way down to the brain and causing damage. That has continued to be a problem. The future implant cannot be like that. The next generation implant cannot be like that. So actually, we also demonstrate this. This is extremely important. My graduate student just demonstrated this. It's very easy for electrical engineer or a circuit designer to design some kind of circuitry and make the integrated circuit. You send it to the foundry, OK? And you make the circuit. But if there are a lot of metal line you need to connect it to this IC chip, it's not so easy, especially we talk about 1,000 channel. Today, Intel, Intel CPU, we're talking about 200, OK? CPU has roughly more than 200, a little bit more than 200 connections. Here, we need to talk about 1,000 or even 10,000, hopefully, in the future. How do you do it? So we actually invented also another technology called pocket technology. We make a pocket with the metal lines. We insert the chip into the pocket. The pocket is very tight. So once the chip is in the pocket, it can be well aligned, mechanical hold, and then use connection to it with a laser to make them connection. So actually, it works beautifully. So that enables us in the future to make multiple chips with huge number of channels to, to make the, the implant. Now, this is another example I think is also very interesting, is spinal cord. Spinal cord implants will take more time. The one reason, actually, we think is because the size issue. Now, we know spinal cord implant, uh, the spinal cord injury is a very serious uh, problem. Five, 100,000 people in the United States. 50% spinal cord injuries are considered complete, which means they cause para or quadriplegic uh, 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 disease. They couldn't, they couldn't move uh, their legs or sometimes both legs and hands. Uh, and like, that, like that Christopher Reeve, his, his neck down actually totally lost the mobility. The spinal cord is also considered part of the brain, so reflexes are still intact, but the brain signal cannot pass down to the spinal cord. If we have devices that can actually connect it to the injury part and, and actually below the dissection or injury part, then wirelessly we can actually connect the signals and, and, and to the brain. You, need, you may need two implants, but still uh, that's possible. And people have been thinking about that, but not much has been done. But for the first experiment, what we do actually is what we call the spinal cord electroarray for mouse. This is something very interesting. It turns out to working on larger animal is much easier, but we were forced to work on small animal, mouse. Uh, that's that's uh, the first proof. You can imagine how difficult try to do a spinal cord implants for a mouse because the spine is about one millimeter. So device has to be made to match that. So we actually made devices. This is a platinum spinal cord implants. Uh, in fact, we are working to make a connector with a chip in there. Uh, I was describing to Bill, you can, you can imagine, we, we learned there are so many challenges. By no means this has been done, but we're just going to that direction. Not only you need to make such a small devices, you have to invent a new surgical procedure to put that inside the, 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 the spine. And the mouse spine actually bend like crazy. Have, have you played with a mouse? You will know that it can actually bend 360 degrees. And this device has to bend with it. So actually, we know a lot of micro-mechanical issues, how these devices has to match mechanical impedance of the tissue that become a new problem. So when we talk about next generation, uh, uh, implants, not only size has to be small, uh, engineers start, have to start thinking about mechanical matching. Not only just bending, because bending, uh, even the material allows you to bend, you still need to have some kind of mechanism to ensure the electro and the neuron position, relative position is not changed by that much. So there cannot be a lot of relative movement 
between the implants and tissues, and, and it's getting very, very interesting. So it opens the door for a lot of problems. So today, in a way, I'm here to tell you there are a lot of problems what we want to do. Not only just demonstrate that we are able to make things smaller and maybe using the integrated cir circuit in a better way to achieve better functionality. So uh, if you consider all that, some interesting things we can do today were not possible yesterday. For example, this, this implant really allow us, actually uh, our collaborator doing experiment to obtain signal simultaneously from different sectors of the spine of the mouse. Um, I apologize for the bloody uh, picture. But that show you that small devices does enable scientists actually to do a lot of things that were not possible um, before. So uh, I, I will also show you a little bit of my other work. This is an intraocular pressure sensor. Believe it or not, glaucoma is a big problem, right? Everybody know glaucoma is a big problem. Glaucoma, uh, the symptom of glaucoma is the intraocular pressure is too high. When it's above, when it's above 20 millimeter mercury, all your, your ophthalmologist is gonna, gonna have to do something uh, to treat you. But believe it or not, how, think about how people measure intraocular pressure today. Do you know how? You all have seen ophthalmology. You have to go to the clinic. There's a device, they use a puff of air, basically a jet air, blow your eye and measure the deformation and, and, and there's a computer with the equation, ooh, calculate back, oh, there's a lot of error. But can you imagine, can you imagine for 400 years of medicine exercise, there's no device that measure your intraocular pressure precisely? There's no such a device. Implantable intraocular pressure sensor. In fact, we show that this technology, again, is parallel, there's coils, there's ton of silicon, and not only that, we can fold it. Actually, the device is designed, you can wrap it up, put it inside a needle, inject into the eye, it will extend it out, so, and the wound is so small, you can go home right away. So it will heal. So we are also demonstrate that. This is a, this is a device, in, again, in an in a, in a animal. It works actually very, very well. Uh, this is uh, another picture I want to show for a lot of research ideas. This is a device also made of paralink. This is a cavity. This cavity actually has six terminals ex extending out. What is this device for? Uh, my collaborators are able to put the embryonic cells. This is a brain cells. This is a hippocampal brain cells. When they are in embryonic stage, they look like a, a six micron size of water balloon. You can put it in there. And this device is designed to physically and mechanically trap the cells in there. It cannot come out. The cell body cannot come out. But the side, six side channels will allow, allow what? The new rights to come out, axons to grow outside this terminal. So what you see over here is you can see a lot of wires coming out from this, this cavity because the neurons want to grow new rights out and to make connection with others. The reason I showed it, we just recently published a paper in the journal uh, Neural Methods. I, 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 we are talking to people who think that the next generation implant not only just a passive electronic device. We think we can combine this concept. We can build these cages and implant, well, implant these neurons or someday stem cells into these cavities to become part of the future neural implants that open also even more doors for what I call the next generation implants. Uh, a lot of people actually believe stem cell can differentiate into the whole cell if under the right condition, although it's a huge research field. If these stem cells actually can make a really close connection with our electrode, in fact, these devices has electrode underneath, we show that we can obtain all the action potentials from these cells we can also stimulate these cells inside the cage. And this cage will trap the cells, trap the cells inside. They, can, they cannot escape, but their, their, their new rights can grow out. And that allows us actually to make another way to bridge to the host tissues, not through just electrical electrodes we build. In fact, through these cells, we're going to trap them. Uh, uh, so 
I show this picture. Uh, other than that, I save this uh, to end my talk. This is one example. This is a, this is a, a, a grandma called Linda. Uh, she has a 16 electro uh, implants, and these are her quote. I'm going to have, a, have to connect a lot of dots. That's suddenly her life becoming connecting dots. Uh, but this tells you she can see dots. And I see where the kitchen table, however, if you learn how to connect a lot of dots and counters are, and I don't knock glasses over anymore. Uh, makes big difference. Even more, now I can follow the action after my grandchild hits the ball in a little league game. She actually can, can, can go to her grandchild's uh, baseball game and see something. Now, this is actually even more amazing, so I'm going to show you this uh, uh, as a closing uh, fun. No one expects grandma to play like a professional. Linda is playing but basketball Linda with her grandchild. Is in is amazing. She's totally blind. The small circle in her glasses is a camera, and some clever electronics turns the images into patterns of dark and light. She shoots better than Shaq. <laughs> Uh, although with only 16 4 by 4 can you imagine if, if, if in the future we, we are successful and soon enough to produce 256 channel or even 1,000 channel implants? Uh, but anyway, uh, this is actually my closing uh, slide. Next generation neural implants, uh, where does it go? They will come. They will come. There's no doubt that we need them. More, more, more interesting, what we learned just today, even a little bit, uh, is we know they're going to su surprise us. Nobody, nobody was able to predict what 4x4 four four can do to these first few patients. Although there are only about 20 uh, human tests right now, we already learned that. It's amazing things are happening to those people. And they learn, they learn, they are very adaptive to use these devices uh, and, and, and surprise the original designers. So we're hoping the future is going to be brighter for them. Uh, sometimes, actually, uh, I, I joke with my students. In the future, you never know. Every student every student going to have a retinal implant in their eye. They come to class. You will think they are listening to the teacher. No, they are watching video games. <laughs> uh, it's totally possible, and future uh, uh, it's unpredictable. But anyway, I would like, I'd like to thank uh, all the sponsors for the work, including uh, NIH, NSF, DAPA, uh, uh, even NASA, some funding come from there. i also like to thank you for your attention. I welcome questions from all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, YC. I think one has to be impressed also by the, the, the students that you've got, too, at the university, because I know they're, I've met a few of them. They're very, very bright, and they don't know that some of this is impossible. They, they believe they can do it, and uh, it's great that you have the resources there that they can apply their uh, talents and curiosity. It's, it's all done by students. It's all <laughs> done by students. My hands are not stable enough to handle those things anymore. Let, let me ask, for, we have a, a couple people out in Boulder. Let me ask if there's some questions in Boulder. I think you can just uh, sp speak and uh, we can hear you. Uh, I had uh, a question about the uh, retina implant. Looks like John Moreland. What? Yeah, this is John Moreland. Um, why don't you use an uh, array of photocells right on the retina? Uh, I, that seems like an obvious thing to try. Yes. In fact, in fact, there's one German company. One German company is, is doing that. Uh, they are developing photocells. Uh, again, it's embedded uh, underneath the ganglion cells. Uh, why they wanted to embed under ganglion cells is because uh, uh, exp some experimental data show that the stimulation current required to trigger the ganglion cells lower. So they actually put it underneath the uh, ganglion cells. And, and, and they found out, actually there are, two, there, there are two, three groups show that they found out just the normal light coming into the eye hitting the photocells 
doesn't generate enough uh, uh, power. You can, you can easily do a calculation, you'll, you'll understand. Indoor, the light is, is not very high. For example, this environment, you probably have only one milliwatt per centimeter square of the light. Uh, that electricity is not enough. But what they found out actually is if they design another circuit, they pass power to it and use that signal as an input, amplify those signal, and then stimulate ganglions, it may be possible that's what they're doing now. However, uh, they, they, they are facing a difficult problem that whenever they put a device underneath the retina, okay, underneath the ganglion cell, it's blocking a lot of nutrition passage from behind the retina to keep those cells healthy. So a lot of concern actually also show over there. Another problem also you can imagine if you put a five millimeter by five millimeter device underneath, you immediately generate the retina detachment problem. You, you, are, you are mechanically forcing and separating tissues. So uh, they are doing those kind of things, but they are facing different problems. Otherwise, what you just ask could be a possibility, and people are doing that. Okay. Over here, the microphone. You didn't say anything about cochlear implants. Are, are those considered sufficiently well advanced for people to hear, or are there still work on that? Yes, actually, uh, we, purposely, we purposely avoid uh, a pacemaker or the cardio uh, uh, implant. And the cochlear implant, because those are very mature, uh, and, and commercialize. Cochlear implant, for example, although there was a drive to push to higher uh, number of channels, you can imagine our audio frequency is from anywhere 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. That's, that's what people say. You know, if you have more channel, it's possible, it's possible, especially by the structure of cochlea, you want to divide those frequency into multiple channels, you can get much better hearing. Uh, real patient experiment actually shows, believe it or not, a channel is, is enough and, and the patient can learn to talk over the phones. And part of the reason is uh, uh, we underestimate how our own neural system can, can be adapted and can handle the signal in a, in a tremendous uh, the way. They can amplify the, the, uh, the sensitivity, they can actually adapt themselves to to, uh, to uh, the frequency issues. So we, over there, we do not see, actually it's also general feeding from the field. They do not see the need to push more than 16 channel or 30 channels probably never needed. Okay. So, so that's why over there, over there, the name of the GAN actually is not the number channel, but vision is, vision is. And actually we also believe uh, the, uh, the cor cortical implant, oh, number of channels, hugely important. Spinal cord implant also hugely important. Those are the most difficult frontiers compared to the cochlear implant. Okay. Uh, two questions. Can, you, can you use a mic? Oh, sure. It would help. Uh, in the meantime, let's take a question, Harold. Is that Harold Marshall? Yes. Uh, I'm interested in the back problems. There are many more people who suffer from back pain, uh, sciatica from an injured vertebrae and they don't want to be operated on, but they're really hampered because of pain. Uh, yes. Can your implant work to get around the injured uh, nerve area such that if they're mechanically able to do things, they won't suffer the pain and can forgo the surgery? That would seem to have a very large customer base for your yes. product. Yes. Uh, to answer you, I, I would I just tell you what's, what's a current development in terms of spinal cord implants. In fact, Medtronic has uh, devices, has commercial product for uh, spinal cord implant, mainly just for pain control, pain management. Over there, however, their device is big, okay? And, and, and they have to be big in the sense that because there's a lot of bending that it can destroy the device if it's not bending, they have to protect it. Their electro is also huge, okay? Now, because of that, it caused many mechanical problems. Imagine that you insert those electrodes inside your spine and try to be close to your, your the, the dura, the, the spinal cord. That actually, there's always some relative motion. In fact, even today, even today, because of that problem that the pain management of using spinal cord implant 
has not been that effective, or at least I would say is not the first choice for doctors. So if you have back pain and know that you go see a doctor, that's a last resort. In fact, it's effective to a lot of people. In fact, if you place the electrode in the right place and also figure out how to stimulate your spine, that is another big research need to be done, exactly how. But if you do it right, it shows that it's always effective to people. But it may not be very reliable. Some people actually say, well, after two weeks of surgery, it works great, but three weeks later, the, the, if the effect just dropped, and then the pain comes back. And because the implant is still not good enough, not ideal, and also the device is what? It's just electrodes insert into the spine, and then with the wire, I show you the wire. It has to have wire, wire bundle coming out and go into a metal case and embed it somewhere under the skin. So all those things actually cause mechanical problems, and mechanical problems cause efficiency and efficiency cause all those things. So for the future implant, we are, we are, trust me, we are dreaming that we're gonna have wireless, all the devices completely inside the spine. And there's no wire sticking out. And it burns a little power. And more importantly, it has multiple channel. Multiple channel become interesting actually compared to today, A channel. Today Medtronic has A channel device. When you have eight channels, okay, and usually these electrodes are very big, the stimulation pattern is limited. Now consider if we have 1,000 channels wrapped around the spine, then our degree of freedom to find what's the maximum stimulation algorithm is broadened. However, it immediately imposes a difficulty, research difficulty. Today we, only, today, we still don't know how to use that eight channels. Trust me, the doctors have to do a lot of try and error. Suddenly, they were given 1,000 channels. You think they can handle it? <laughs> no. So actually, that actually is a, some research topic we're doing. In fact, my students and my colleagues or students are working out. If, working out if suddenly we have 1,000 channels attached to the spinal cord, how are you going to use them? Our biology background tells us that everybody's a circuit, the neural circuit is different. In fact, your circuit and mine are different. Although we all can walk and move and jump, well, not as good as Michael Jordan, but we, we, have the, we, we all have different circuits. So that means what? There's no one algorithm or one mapping for all people. So actually the future device has to consider, suddenly we have that many channels but how to use that many channels to fit each individual customer, okay? And, and, and actually find out the most suitable stimulation pattern. And, and also maybe day by day find a new pattern because we are changing too. We are growing old. Those will become total possibility for the future implants. That actually are all the problems that, that may lead to the question you ask. It's, it's not simple, it's complicated, but we think it's very exciting. Henry yeah. Medler. Yeah, I have two questions. At the very beginning, you were discussing the, possi the possibility of these retinal implants, and uh, it occurs to me that if someone's been blind for a while, the ganglia might die or at least wither away from lack of use yes. so that you cannot really uh, innervate them afterwards. The second question has to do with the possibility of an entirely different uh, direction, which is uh, using stem cells to, to replace these deficient, uh, deficient circuits. Yes. The first question. In fact, if you look into how many ganglion cells we have right now in, right, in the macula, which is about five millimeter area, about one million, about one million. In fact, actually for 1,000 channel, you probably only need 1,000 ganglions. In fact, a lot of people also say because there's a bipolar cells in the connect these ganglion cells, you may not need a lot of ganglion cells. So actually, uh, at least my collaborator taught me that 
he doesn't think you need perfect, healthy macula in order to have these implants. That actually one thing. Second thing is even there's a problem. The future actually seems to be promising to use stem cells, you see. In fact, my Colorado already done the stem cell. Uh, the simple experiment is you put stem cells into the retina uh, where the animal actually purposely you kill their full of receptors. What they found one thing is very interesting. That's why I introduced the cage. Remember, I show you the cage. When you put stem cells in the retina, and they, they move around. They don't want to stay where you want them to stay. It's, it's always Murphy's rule. This is the first experiment. Always show that. Wherever you put them, they, they don't want to stay where you want them to stay. It is really like that. So actually, we, have, we, we, we think it's, it's awfully interesting to have some mechanical device, some kind of MEMS device, not just electrical, some mechanical device can contend and can fix and can, 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 can basically do not allow them to go everywhere they want. Basically, you constrain them to where you want them to be, right in front the ganglion cells you want to stimulate, right in front the macular area you, you, you target for. If that's actually possible, it can, it can greatly improve not just today's simple electro ganglion cell interface. The interface actually has stem cells in between or stem cell will differentiate into the right cell you want. Again, that's a very rich research. I cannot say it's going to work, but we think those problems may have answers to it. We're looking for it. But, but, but your concern is exactly right. It's also our concern. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, all the pictures you showed, and this may just be simplification, um, seem to have this, this implication that every electrode had its own um, wire going all the way back up and yes. coming out. I was curious if it made sense or if you're doing anything where you place some sort of demultiplexer inside the, inside the patient and have a, a single wire multiplex so you do you know, 1,000 frames a second or something. Very good question. This is an electrical engineering question. So the, the way to answer you is, yes, we are doing multiplexing, but how much multiplexing you can do depends on stimulation of ganglion cells. Okay, from experiments, we found out each ganglion cell, in order to trigger the ganglion cell, so the ganglion cell will send a signal to the brain, it takes 10 milliseconds. Okay. Now, if you know that's 10 milliseconds, then you can design how much multiplexing you need because it's limited by that 10 milliseconds. Right. Okay. Thanks. We have considered that. Herb? Yeah, Herb. I have uh, two questions. One is, what kind of reliability test do you perform for the electronics before you make a decision, it's worthwhile to implant either into an, a research mode or in the case. Yes, of in fact, uh, I I didn't show you a lot of data. It, it's in, in my student thesis. Ooh, we spend more time doing reliability of these devices than than uh, design or uh, uh, other things. We do tremendous amount of soaking tests, soaking tests in saline. So which is uh, uh, the similar, just the salt water, but there's similar the eye fluid. We do accelerated, we do a lot of accelerated soaking tests at different temperatures. In fact, typical temperatures from 50 degrees C all the way to uh, 89 degrees C, 87 degrees C. So we actually understood the reliability issues of these extremely well before, actually before we have a final design. Unfortunately, I didn't show you I, uh, my fault, but if you want to see some of the data, I will show you. In fact, uh, these techniques develop all can survive if, if our accelerated data is correct. They, they, they suggest that these devices should easily survive for 20 years without any problems. In fact, some of the devices, the cable, for example, okay, the, the, the chip protection, according to accelerated data, if you extrapolate that, it can be 30, 40 years long. So that part at least has been taken care of. The, the thing actually we are not very clear at this point, this point, although we're doing a lot of Lego testing, is mechanical reliability. So we believe, we believe even we put these devices inside the eye, even the eye, in fact, eye is faster than move, 
moving organ in, in, in the whole body, the, the bandwidth wise. So there will be concerns from acceleration, deceleration. There will be concern about eye fluid move, movement inside and whether these devices can be mechanically reliable. That's something we're doing. That's something we're testing. And so, my, other, yeah, my, excuse me, my other question is the following. You mentioned the, that you do design. And to what extent are you using computer-assisted design tools? And are they adequate for the biological applications? Since most of them probably are derived from the semiconductor industry. Yes, actually the IC chip, I'm not talking about IC chip. IC chip has its own industry. The mechanical design actually is done by us through a lot of mechanical model. In fact, I show you, I show you the paralink with a platinum uh, electrode being put inside the animal eyes. The purpose of those is try to come up with the best mechanical model that actually fulfill all the requirements. Now here, I have to also add, just for your information, it's not just mechanical model after it's implanted. In fact, we learn, we learn. The, 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 the most important part actually is to design a model to match a surgical procedure. It's the process and how and where and when you put what part into a small tight space. It turns out that is our experience shows is more crucial than the later mechanical performance. Although both are very important. So, so there are a lot of issues. This is why I say, uh, keep, keep telling my, my graduate student uh, they should stay 20 years for their PhD. It's, it's, it's really not a joke because that's how complicated this whole thing are and your comments well taken. I would love to talk to you more about many other problems. So you know what, today you asked me one, one one question I can give you 10 problems to, to think about. It's, there's, there's no problem at all for me to do that. Uh, two more questions. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, just a quick question. Um, you showed us an example of the mouse, and, you know, and obviously the, you have a lot of nonlinear elasticity issues yes. and, and must pertain to how you try to model this. And so with that in mind, I was just wondering if you could explain to us some of the sort of materials issues that, that come that are really important in developing uh, these materials. Yes. Where, Perhaps people at NIST could help. You, you, you tried to force me to open the can of worm, but let me <laughs> yeah. try to start from the basic thing. What we not know? Just the electro itself, just the electro itself. It's, it's platinum electro, some cases is gold. And then it's encapsulated by this wonderful polymer, which is, which is uh, the, the FDA uh, favor, this, this paralink. Interface. For example, if you have a lot of bending, mm -hmm. the metal polymer interface has been a problem. Many of you would know, okay, actually, because uh, their elastic property is different and all that. We actually figured out a way to solve that problem. Believe it or not, uh, we have a process. Uh, the way we do it is uh, uh, use the ebbing evaporation, and we purposely allow the first uh, the, 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 the first deposition, very thin deposition with an extremely high temperature uh, to, to penetrate or, or embed themselves into the perlin to solve that interface problem. But still, there's an interface problem. Then, big bending, we also found, we also found platinum, if you do not design the thickness right, depending on how much bending you have, it cracks. You're actually cracking in platinum is a problem. Beyond the cracking of platinum, in fact, we also see if the perlin, which is a polymer, if the thermal history of control of the polymer is not right, because it does recrystallization. It tried to form polycrystalline, just like polyethylene would do the same thing. Polymer will also crack. And there's a, SN, there's a curve you have to do experiment to find out under what stress, what kind of bending, how many times. This polymer actually fracture comes in. It's all mechanical thing. In addition, there's a, then you ask this large stretching, okay? For example, you put into the, the spinal cord. So we are designing electro, for example, we don't want just straight ones. We actually don't like the f flat straight ones. We like the circular cable, okay? So we are making spiral shape cables and also encapsulated by rubber-like material like silicone. Mm -hmm. So those things actually are under research 
uh, for specific use, but for mouse implant, we're doing that right now. We found out we have to do. I have a picture I didn't show the general audience. I have a picture hidden in my laptop I'll show you. If you don't do that, the cable is like, if you put a little flexible thing in your hand, if you grind it, all the failure move from there shows in my device. So there are, again, this is a very rich thing, but I have to say, depending on the application, the design has to be fine-tuned, uh, understand the failure mode and try to avoid those failure mode. Ideally, we want the cable that put in there, it can be stretched like this, it can be bent like this, it can be twisted like that. Uh, uh, I don't think the uh, traditional macro cable can do that. No, you cannot do a, a pacemaker cable like that. But for micro cable, we think we have a lot of rooms. Uh, it's relatively unexplored. Really, nobody had these devices before. Uh, but those are very interesting uh, uh, problems to deal with. And you asked a very good question. OK, last question. You joked around a little bit and said something about uh, video games with the future students. but. Honestly, do you think this technology will advance to the point where after curing the blind, healthy adults might actually uh, elect to have an implant put in so that they can do, uh, say, computer interface or um, future video conferencing with their children across the world or uh, something else like that? I mean, is this something that is uh, 50, 100 years down the road? Or OK. To answer you, I think there are two cases I can brought up. One, uh, the, uh, the direct answer to you, I, I think without improvement of our current retinal implant, no. Why? The coil, where to put the coil is a big problem. However, we are working on one new technology. Uh, we do not want to put the coil inside the lens capsule. In, uh, if we have to put inside the lens capsule, that means the lens has to be taken out. <laughs> Normal people don't want that to happen. But for blind people, the lens has no use, so that's not a problem, okay? So actually for healthy people, come back to healthy people, believe it or not, uh, some military people are interested in this technology. For example, if you have an implant, it can allow you to see infrared. Would, would that be interesting? It could be very interesting. Or to see UV, right, specifically just UV. Uh, different spectrum. We are also trying to put a coil just directly on top of the iris. It's in the anterior chamber. In fact, uh, my collaborator think it's doable. Um, but we still need to do a lot of animal tests and figure out whether it's feasible or not. If that can be done, yes, I think healthy people <laughs> can have the implant, the future implant. And it, it really doesn't do any harm. It really doesn't do any harm. It adds additional capability to the eye. Although that's a big assumption, okay? But, but mechanically and physically, I think it's possible. Now, another possible approach, another possible approach is you may not put the whole device inside the eye. You can, you get, a lot of people are working on that. I, I read that it's, it's like a contact lens. It's really a contact lens. Mm -hmm. Contact lens type of devices, but inside the contact lens, you have coils, you have, you have uh, the image display, uh, uh, there, there's no engineering reason that it cannot happen. So, so uh, I guess that's what military people like to hear, but a lot of work needs to be done, but that's, that's I think, what I can have for your question. Okay, I've, I've got one more question. Sure. <clears throat> Back pain, uh, one of the other questions made me think of this. Acupuncture has been shown to, to relieve things like back pain as well as other things in people that have sort of a osteoporosis or scoliosis. And it lasts for one or two days, great, but then you've got to go back for another acupuncture treatment to get stuck, literally stuck, yes. by the needle. So does any of this technology have the potential of being implanted so you can more or less give it an electrical signal and give your own stick every two, two days uh, with something that's permanently implanted? and therefore effectively get the acupuncture treatment? You, you asked a really good question. In fact, I discussed, not long ago, I discussed this with my acupuncture uh, uh, <laughs> master. I, I had allergy, in fact, so uh, he does acupuncture. It works, it works yeah. for me. Yeah. Uh, 
The implant actually today we're using, especially for cortical implant, is already a needle. Okay. Somehow, somehow my master actually told me that uh, uh, two things are important. One, position definitely is very important. And, and position can vary from person to person a little bit. Sometimes when they, when they insert a needle, they need to use a feeling to do it. The, uh, another, another thing actually is, is also very interesting, relatively unproven or, or, or not yet studied enough. In fact, in order for acupuncture to also work, you may need to create, purposely create some damage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somehow damage may trigger the positive effect. At least that's what my master told me. I'm not an expert. If that's the case, actually, our implant, our implant, at least based on what we're working on, uh, is not a device designed to create damage. But, but it does provide the electrical uh, stimulation part, which actually Medtronic's devices is, is based on, which is scientifically proven that works to do the pain management. So uh, uh, this actually comes back to the question, exactly what acupuncture is doing. What's the basic uh, science? And uh, my understanding is not quite clear. Although the uh, NIH spent a lot of money, does show that it has a pain management effect. So that's why insurance can cover it. But the basic science is still not quite understood. So I, I, sh I should not comment too much on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope you agree with me. <laughs> Let's thank uh, Dr. Tai one more time. Thank you.